let me introduce my friend, Dr. Erez Soref. I want to start, Erez, by let's, let's put some cards on the table, right? It was not obvious in your youth that you were going to be uh, the head of uh, God's project, uh, this Bible college and a, and a broader ministry. We'll get into that in a moment. That, that did not seem obvious from, you know, your, your baptism as a child? No, no, you were not baptized as a child. Well, tell us a, a little bit about your story. So, uh, yeah, so when I was 22, it was after my military service, and I was uh, traveling in Asia and then ended up in Europe. And uh, I met a group of Christians for the first time in my life, and they told me that Jesus changed their lives. And I was like, good for you. <laughs> Happy for you. They said, no, he can change your life. I said, my life is fine first. And also, I'm Jewish. We don't believe in Jesus. And, um, you know, what happened to me was in Paul's words that... Gentile believers have caused me to jealousy, which, by the way, in parenthesis, I'll say, is one of the most important and often most neglected missiological tasks of the church. Um, and the, the um, causing me to jealousy was through, you know, really observing their life. And um, one of the translations, by the way, is that Gentiles are supposed to provoke the Jews to jealousy. Now, I think the Gentiles have done a lot of provoking. Historically, not always to jealousy. Yes, I mean, historically speaking, putting a sword to your neck and say, you know, it has not worked. No. Not, not worked. So the way they provoked me to jealousy was, um, you know, I just saw the, the way they lived. And the shocking thing was there were two things that were really shocking. One was, you know, we, 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 when we pray, we talk to God spontaneously. We, we, we have a relationship with God. And this is something that is very foreign to a traditional Jewish mindset. Because, you know, you have written prayers and God is, I mean, he's, he's um, kind of running the universe, but, you know, he's way too far out and busy to care for your personal minute, you know, little things in, in life. But um, so anyway, that was very shocking to me to see how they spoke to God. And what's more, you know, to, to my God, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that hypothetically, at least, I was supposed to, you know, know him in some way, which I didn't. Uh, that was the first thing. The second thing that was even more surprising is that they were more familiar with the Hebrew Bible than I was. And I think oftentimes many um, believers are not aware of it, but... As a believer, as a Gentile believer, you probably know the Hebrew Bible better than most Jewish people you meet. And that was to me an absolute shock. It's like, why would you even read the Hebrew Bible? You know, that's our book. You know, you guys have the New Testament, whatever that may be. But, you know, so those kind of things, those two things really caused me to at least desire to look more deeply into it. And... Um, and as I did, I was, I, you know, really ended up reading the New Testament, starting reading the New Testament after going through an inner struggle, whether I should or shouldn't. But when I did, I was, I was completely shocked. It was kind of like the Syrian friend you mentioned earlier. It's like, hey, just a moment, you know, the Sea of Galilee, Jerusalem, Caesarea. I mean, I've, I've been to all those places. You know, Jesus walked in places that I've visited many, many, many times. And it all took place in a Jewish environment. Um, so, particularly the orthodox or religious leaders of Jesus' day, they're still very much with us to this day, same kind of practices. Uh, what was very special to me was actually Jesus himself. I really liked him. <laughs> um, and as you read the New Testament, it's like, well, what's not to like? I mean, really, what, what's not to like? You know, in retrospect, uh, amazing. Uh, the Word of God changed something within me. And I, could, I couldn't put it into words at the time, but I could understand that personally there's nothing I can do, you know, to earn God's favor. Uh, what could I do? I mean, I, you know, again, in Paul's language, offer my body to be burned. And what good would that do? And uh, understanding this, uh, you know, later I could put it in words and say my sinful nature, um, I realized that I need God's favor and God's grace. Uh, with the um, great sense of joy, you know, of, of, of knowing God, there's also uh, came a sense of well, a passion, but also um, 
a sadness of how come, you know, our people don't know about God. And so from, from that sense, I think from that passion, God has, has I mean, called me back to go back and tell my parents, my you know, family, my friends. And out of this passion was born one for Israel and, and the Bible college that is part of it. And so this is what we get up in the morning to do, to tell our people about Jesus and help them grow. Those that come to know the Lord grow in faith and so on. So, yes, even I would say 30 years ago, it happened 30 years ago. If you would ask me what I'll do, you know, when I grow up, as it were, this would not have been part <laughs> of my <laughs> wildest dreams. When we got to know uh, you guys at the Joshua Fund, and uh, again, it, you guys stood out because unlike other kind of ministries, you really wanted to get to know us and to, to see what's happening. And so uh, right at that phase, God told me to build television studios in our new campus, which you guys were helpful to help us renovate. And so we did. And I knew nothing about television studios or real estate in any way, shape, or form. And then, um, you know, this young man, uh, I always told him, and actually my wife always told him, there's going to be a day that you're going to come serve with us. So go do your thing with other places, get trained, but we're going to call you up. So I called him up, and I know how to approach the guy, and basically I told him, okay, it's time. You need to leave whatever it is you're doing. We have television studios, and you need to do this. And um, he came, and he, he brought the data with him. And the data was, and I think he presented to you guys as well, that the public square is no longer out there on the streets, but the public square is basically here. And if we want to reach this generation with the gospel, we have to create a new wineskin. And that's a wineskin. That's all it is. And so we have started, uh, we've sent them for further training, actually here in the U.S. And uh, we started creating stories. So we, we built those sites. And then we realized that it's going video. It's not going yeah. text anymore. Mm -hmm. And we started recording uh, testimonials, you know, which is a personal story in five or five to eight minutes. And down the road, you did yours, and I did mine, and many other Jewish believers did theirs. Telling our people says, okay, there's, there, there are people, Jewish people, from similar backgrounds like ours, that have come, that have searched and researched and come to know that Yeshua is the Messiah. So we had people from religious background, we had people from secular background, and um, this, this was the beginning. Um, we found that testimonials, you know, stories is a good way to start, but then they had a lot of questions. And we distilled the questions we discovered. It comes down to roughly 50 to 100 questions that all Jewish people ask. You know, different things like, for example, some of them are, uh, that are unique for the Jewish people is Isaiah 53 talking about uh, the nation of Israel. is a suffering servant in the nation of Israel or the Messiah. And, and many others like it. And so we've produced a series of apologetics. And we've been doing that, you know, in different waves, in different waves, ways and forms. Uh, recently, we had a public debate, the first ever public debate on video with an Orthodox rabbi. You know, really, it was the first time since the time of, of the New Testament yeah. that is an intra-Jewish discussion between a leading rabbi and a Jewish believer in Jesus, talking about the messiahship of Jesus. It was actually a, a step that leads to that. So some truly historical issues. And, um, you know, we're getting weekly, um, uh, weekly, we're really daily uh, messages on our, on our networks. And I would even say something else, you know, for the first time in 2,000 years, there's actually, you know, Jewish believers in Jesus have risen from within Israel and stood, stood up to the uh, Pharisaic rabbinic leadership that basically banned Jesus from our people. And so the, this ping pong or Wimbledon, you know, it wasn't very gentlemanlike in many no. times. But it wasn't love, 15 love. It was not 15 hate. 15 hate, absolutely. <laughs> but um, the point is that it's the sim symbolism of it is much greater than just the content mm -hmm. because it really did not happen for close to 2,000 years. So let me read you a couple of messages. Okay, this is from last week. So this guy writes, I have to tell you 
I was an Orthodox Jew and I studied in a yeshiva. It's a religious school. But I was disappointed from what I saw there and I left. I left when I was 18 and a half. I'm 21 now. And a year ago, I was exposed to your YouTube channel. I'm sorry, a month ago, I was exposed to your YouTube channel and it changed my life completely. I used to be a very angry person, but knowing Jesus, I turned to a forgiving person and um, your videos have truly helped me understand what God wants for me. Well, that, that was, you know, an Orthodox guy last week. Another message, hello and sorry for the hour. I have a lot of questions. I hope you can help me. I've never read the Bible, but I read and, and watch your videos and your debates for a year and a half about God and the Messiahship of Jesus. I was so impressed from the cosmological argument to the moral argument. I'm convinced that there's a creator with personality and intelligence for the universe. Um, and I heard about the Holy Spirit. Can you help me understand how I pray to the Holy Spirit and experience God? I really appreciate your work. Because of you, I started this journey. Thank you so much for everything. So we get tons of those. So double dienu, triple dienu, quadruple dienu. And then there would be people who say, okay, can we meet? Can we have coffee? So then they said, well, our staff can do some, but it, you know, in the grand scheme, it's a fairly limited team. So what about, well, that guy is from Haifa. Maybe we have some pastors and ministry leaders up in Haifa. Maybe we ought to get them involved and sort of, you know, pass this off and see if the pastor in Haifa can, can meet or the pastor in, in uh, Demona or in, uh, you know, in Tel Aviv or whatever. So that became part of the, the, the national church strategy, uh, Israel College of the Bible, because of its role in training and equipping not just young people in, in ministry, but also uh, people in their, you know, in their, during their career. You can take classes. You can take classes online. Uh, you can come, you just get a certificate, maybe not a full degree. But this is the national equipping center for the national body. So, uh, so there's a lot of trust. And that's one of the things we've been encouraged by is um, you are, you're all very careful to keep building trust. But what that means then is ministry leaders, pastors around the country are just like, yeah, these are qu like qualified leads. Sure, we'll be happy to go have coffee with this person. And, and, and you've seen a lot of people come to faith because of it. That's exactly right. Um you know, because the vast majority of the pastors in the country have been trained by us, and you know, like you say, the element of trust is very, is very, very important. Is a key here, so we can refer to them, the the many seekers that um, that are coming, and um, you know, this last year, actually year and a half, I guess, with the pandemic, what we've seen is that there was actually a tremendous surge, both in the terms of of uh, views and seekers. I think the proximity to death, you know, to the pandemic and existential kind of tension caused people to turn and look for more meaning. So um, our viewership has just gone up dramatically this year. Yeah, so here's months. the new numbers. I just actually checked with his director of media and I said, just as we come into this uh, epicenter briefing, I'd like to brief them on the actual, what, where are we at this point? And he, he said that since they started, uh, there have now been more than 40 million views just of the Hebrew language videos alone. Now there are not obviously 40 million Hebrew speakers on the planet. Uh, there's roughly 10 million in Israel and maybe you know a few hundred thousand, maybe a million you know in the diaspora. But, but what, what, what you're seeing is the Pringles effect. Right? The people are, you know, not everybody in the country has seen them, but those who've seen them are watching more than one. Okay? 40 million. And, and uh, you know, whatever, six, seven years ago, I don't remember exactly when, 10 years uh, ago, this it, didn't exist. It wasn't the, possible even. And this last year alone was about 10 million. That's this amazing. Last year. So a 25% increase this year. Now, this alone would be enough of all. However, there's more. Then they said, well, this is Hebrew, and this is mostly focused on Jews. What about Israeli Arabs? And what about Palestinian Arabs? So you built out your team. That's right, and it's, it's always been very important for us that we serve the whole body of Christ as one body of Christ. It's made up of Jews and Arabs, and so um, many, many of our students and graduates are Arab, you know, Arab leaders in their communities, and of course that's also reflected on our staff. And in the last five years um, or so, we have a, a Arabic evangelism team, which Joshua Fan also helped us uh, uh, begin, 
And some amazing stories in the Arab world, amazing stories in the Arab world about people coming. I mean, this one country in the Middle East that is, is a sworn enemy of Israel, and so this Muslim guy who's a son of a very well-known uh, Muslim leader in the Arab world starts to watch our videos in Arabic, connect to, connects to our team, and after about six months declares that he's a believer in Jesus. Uh, start telling his family and friends, and of course he got severely persecuted for that. Um, and then about a year into it, he he is diagnosed with cancer. His health really deteriorates, and everybody's like, "Oh, that's punishment from Allah for you know betraying him and becoming a Christian." And he starts looking to where he can go to get treatment for for cancer in different countries. And lo and behold, the state of Israel allows him to come in. So he comes into uh, Israel, he calls our team, they go to visit him, they pray with him, they sing with him. Um, actually, there were other people that heard it, and the hospital administrator, who is the nominal Israeli Arab Christian, comes to know the Lord. Wow, and, wow um, that's amazing, I didn't know that part. Several, several days after, um, he seems to be getting a little bit better, you know, he has no hair, he can't walk, he's, he's not doing very well. He calls the guy up, calls our team up, he says, I may die. I've, I was never baptized. No, no one would baptize me in my home country. I need to be baptized. Can you come get me and baptize me? So, you know, Arab, Arab evangelism leader calls me up. He says, uh, so can we baptize him on the roof of our building today? He's like, okay, bring him over. Wasn't that like a 6.30 in the morning phone it call? It was like, an yeah. early morning call. It's like, are you okay? He says, yeah. So anyway, he brought him up. We bought, we bought a kiddie pool, filled it up on, on the roof. You know, we had about 40 people from our staff there, you know, Jews and Arabs. And this brother, this Arab brother and, and me, we baptized him. And um, so we kind of looked around and said, did any one of us getting up this morning thought that we have, you know, a Muslim background believer from this enemy country be, come to our campus on the roof that the Joshua Fund helped us buy, actually. In Israel, and you have to buy the roof. Of a building. And yeah, the reason yeah. is because someone else could buy it and build their own building. On, you know, uh, uh, so you have to buy it so you can keep it to yourself. So the long and the short of it, the end of the story is that there was, there was about a couple of months ago, he went back to uh, where he's from. And he just uh, wrote us the other week. Um, he says the doctors can't understand it. The, um, the cancer in the brain disappeared. And the cancer in the lymph nodes has shrunk to about half the size. Praise God, the doctors that's so can't awesome. explain it. His hair is growing. He's walking by himself. Uh, pray with us for complete healing for him. Amen. Amen. Wow. I don't know what the Arabic for Dayenu is. We'll ask uh, one of our uh, Arabic friends here. But I will say, um, I checked on the on the Arab. Uh, testimony numbers also and, 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 and gospel numbers uh, of those videos. And so the director of that program said, uh, we're now past 5 million views. I mean, think about that. It just, uh, and, it, and of course, digitally, you're not just saying, well, we're just going to limit it to Israel and the Palestinian territories, right? If you're digital, you're digital. And so anybody who can read Arabic can read it, can, can watch it. So that is going um, uh, significantly beyond uh, the borders of the Holy Land. Well, we need to close in prayer because it's exciting, but you can see this is, you're just getting a taste of the, the, the type of people um, and, the, and, the, and the type of things, the miracles that the Lord is doing. We're not expecting that everybody in the country is going to come to faith uh, in our lifetime. Uh, it'd be awesome if it happened in our lifetime, and somebody's lifetime it's going to happen. But, um, and we're not even sure always that people will come to faith at all. The question is, they deserve to know. They have to be able to hear. Somebody has to tell them. They have to tell them in a language they understand. They have to answer their questions. They have to be able to honestly weigh, is Jesus who he said he is or not? Because that's the most important question. And if you're going to head into eternity, you have to have made that, you have to have processed that question. And Erez, I want to just thank you, your team, for your faithfulness. This is the spiritual warfare that goes with it is brutal, um, but th there has been wonderful, sweet fruit, and uh, we're so encouraged. Let me pray for you and the team. Thanks, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you what you did in Erez's life to save him. Um, he was not heading in a direction that 
you know, towards you, but you came. You're the shepherd, and you, you came to find the lost sheep and bring him into the fold. And, and now he's a shepherd. You've trained him and equipped him to be a shepherd and to go find in the name of our great king and our coming savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen.